The other one I've got on tonight is Jeff. Jeff, you with me yet? Hello, Jeff. I don't know where Jeff is, but he should be here. Um, anyway, we've got uh, got Rob. We can cover with him. Hopefully, if he comes, oh, maybe this is him here. Let's see if that's him. There we go. i got Wisconsin. I am unmuted. Is that Jeff? I feel good about this. Yeah, so Hi, I'm... Jeff. <laughs> Trust me, we don't buy it. We're nice people. You can, you can count <laughs> on that. I've pretty much taken a, taken a kin to that. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get going here, let me give my little disclaimer. Since, uh, since my good buddy isn't here, he'll be here about 7. Um Anything you hear on the show tonight, don't consider it to be legal advice. We do not give legal advice. If you want legal advice, go hire some shyster that's willing to take your money and lie to you that's licensed by the state to do so. Uh, anyway, the law doesn't matter here. We prove that on a daily basis. We Almost every day in every court, it doesn't matter. It only matters if the planet far, far away where the law does matter. Like I say, it doesn't matter here. So that's why you got guys like Rod Class and, and uh, Jeff Herbs here that are going to bring us up to speed. That being said, Jeff and Rod, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, Rob, I don't know if you know Jeff's uh, story here at all, but uh, before we get going, Jeff, uh, why don't you bring us up to speed what's going on? Now, also, in my opinion, for what that's worth, 50 cents, and that'll give you a cup of coffee, maybe. Um, Jeff's son was murdered, uh, in my opinion, murdered in 09. Is that correct, Jeff? I don't want to make sure yes, I get this. Yes, it in is. In 09. And it looks like the police department's the one that did it. And these low life SOBs, I mean, I can't wait till the day comes when we get to start throwing bullets back at them. But that's just me. Uh, you know, that's just the way I think. And since they're taking all their guns, we're going to have to throw them or use slingshots to, to, uh, to get them to take them. Anyway, Jeff, welcome to the show. And why don't we start with, if you don't mind, the uh, what happened with your son and. and Kind of give us fill us in on so we know where we're coming with this and what's going on and what we're doing now. Well, a little a little background information on this would be that uh, I had a son. Uh, very 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 uh, much on to things and, and uh, kind of rebellious as as uh, everyone should be. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, he had some problems in his youth and and uh, things like that with. But uh, as he went through life, he he, uh, he already knew that things just weren't quite what they uh, should have been, and, and uh, uh, certainly weren't TV picture perfect. So he kind of educated himself, and he was pretty smart at the young age of 19. And the, the cops would hassle him, and, and uh, he'd ask him if he's under arrest and all this other stuff. Anyway, they really didn't like him because he's setting a bad example for their uh, income gathering procedures uh, known as statute law. But anyway, uh, he was doing quite well and, and getting on with his life and, and uh, still that fateful night uh, on my son it was Father's Day morning 2009 at 10 to 2 hanging in my back garage. What a mix that is. But anyway, uh, I further found out since then that uh, the evidence that I found on the Internet, other things looking at, is uh, he really did not have any of the symptoms of death by affixation by uh, a ligament around the, the neck. And uh, he didn't have the typical... What would be very typical for something like that would be uh, to have nosebleeds or blood vessels in your eyes uh, leaking or uh, even blood pooling in your extremities like your hands or your feet. Uh, anyway, uh, that evening, was, which is just absolutely horrible, uh, I, I found him at 10 to 2, as I said, and uh, I called the, the police and they came out, and there were no lights. There were no nobody driving fast. It was like they already knew about it, and they come out, and uh, the, the shed I've got, i got a pretty good-sized lot. Uh, is back in the northeast corner, and I have lights and things, but uh, just uh, so they show up, and right away they're hassling me like, 
I had done something to, to the kid, and uh, I did. They were trying. They were trying to fix the blame on you. Yes, they were. They're, they're, they're asking me, well, what went on here tonight, and all this other stuff, you know. And here I am. I would, I'd been gone for the day, and and I didn't even. Uh, I didn't get home till twenty after ten, and then I was wondering where where Thomas was because his car was in the driveway and. Earlier that morning, he tried to take his motorcycle to work, and it, 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 it uh, quit running. It was on uh, Highway 29 West from where I live here in Wisconsin. And uh, me, I was I, uh, had just had surgery in my left shoulder, so I was had a mobilizing cast on or sling, and I went to I went to pick him up, put a trailer behind the van, and and my wife at that time and I went and picked up Thomas. And uh, he was to be work at work at like five o'clock, and he called called the home at about five to five. But anyway, went and picked him up and and uh, got him home. And uh, there was some stuff going on where he didn't tell me, but he'd gotten a couple of tickets on his motorcycle Thursday night, and uh, he'd gotten a phone call Friday night, in fact, from uh, Todd Johnson. And uh, Todd uh, Todd Johnson was had told him that night from what Thomas had told me that uh, Thomas had previously gotten a underage drinking ticket and a uh, a ticket for disorderly conduct because he wouldn't let the cops give it, he wouldn't take a breathalyzer test and I think obstructing an officer also and uh, anyway this Todd Johnson had told him Friday night on the phone when he called that uh, he was going to revoke Thomas's bond for the underage drinking ticket that they gave him with, with no evidence of course and was going to keep him in jail long enough to lose his job. Well, Thomas really liked his job. He felt good about that and made him feel good, and, and uh, that shattered his life. And then plus he'd gotten those two tickets, and after uh, he was really making some strides to uh, develop a level of normalcy in his life. Well, anyway, so Thomas's motorcycle quit which on Saturday morning, and uh, after all this other crap going on, and, and uh, he took his car to work, and, and I went to a family gathering quite a ways away and uh, didn't get home that night until 20 after 10. I'm wondering where he is. He's not here. He didn't leave a note. And uh, my wife at the time, I says, well, you know, geez, I can't understand this about Thomas. I says, he never called. He never left a note. I said he's been very, very good at that. He he lets us know where he is. And she started making excuses. Uh, well, I he said to me that one of his friends was in town and he might go there and on and on. I says, no. I says he still would have left a note. And I wasn't feeling feeling very well because I was like 19 days out of that surgery and had a, had a terrific amount of pain. So, you know, I'm wondering, kind of believing her. And then I uh, I sat in the recliner and fell asleep, and then, uh, like I said, at 10 to 2, I woke up, and I went out and found my son hanging on a rope, and uh, and came back in the house, and I says, you know, screaming, crying, whatever, and uh, woke Marianne up and told her that Thomas was dead, and, and that she went out with me and saw him hanging there, and, and uh, lapsed in the yard, and all this other stuff, and I had already called. I had called the police when I went into the house, and and uh, like I said, they showed up, and it was like, uh, "Where's the popcorn?" was kind of their uh, attitude. And their now, there, you've, you've had a you've had a death in your family. Let me see if I can recap this. Death yes. in your family of your son. He's hanging in the garage. You call nine one one. You tell them, you know, send an ambulance, send the police, whatever, because my son is hanging in the garage, and they casually pulled up. No lights and siren, no ambulance, and they just kind of strolled in haphazardly, no excitement, no anxiousness to make sure he's dead. Um, it was a very casual night on the town for the boys in blue. That's that's correct. They, uh, I don't even believe they went up to. The, they didn't even go up to the body. I mean, they didn't check for any pulse or nothing like that, and just left him hanging there. And and uh, and, and they're like telling me, uh, asking me, well, what went on here? Uh, what did you do today, and on and on and on, and I'm just thinking, what? You know, and uh, here I am, I'm really laid up, because like I said, I got an immobilized sling on my uh, left arm, and and, uh, 
yeah, they're 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 acting like you know, uh, like what did you do to your kid here? You know. Anyway, uh, they're giving me all this stuff, and I says, hey, hey, I says I already told you. I says I didn't get home till twenty after ten. I said, uh, if you have questions, you should ask him. I says he's hanging right in there, and and uh, oh, they're just going on and on and on, and they're you know, and there's two cops. One of them is Thomas Thornton, and the other one is uh, a sergeant from the Chippewa County Sheriff's Department, uh, Robert Cunningham. And they're giving me the third degree. I mean, they're uh, we we have, like you said, excellent. We have a death here, a kid, a, a child, my child, and uh, they're acting like I had something to do with this. Anyway, and they weren't. There was no emotion. It was just like you know, uh, like I said, uh, where's the popcorn? Hmm. So. I called two friends in the interim, and uh, one showed up uh, before the actually before the police even got her because he lives real close. And the other guy showed up later, and uh, he was told he he if he got out of his car he was going to be arrested. In other words, we have way too many eyes here. And I called uh, uh, the priest from church, and he came out with his wife. And so we had the two cops there. Uh, one of my friends in his car on the road and the other friend sitting at the picnic table outside with 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 uh Thomas's stepmother and the one cop's going in and out, the sergeant, Robert Cunningham, and actually went in the house and got Mary Ann some the uh, uh the uh, wife at the time got her a drink of water and uh anyway there's all sorts of things that happen, and the, the priest is there, and I'm staying by Thomas because uh, trust the police around around him, even even when he's dead. And this this uh, priest from church shows up with a black rope, and he asks my friend. He says, and I'm going to keep him uh, out of the picture. He's just my one of my friends. We can call him friend one if you like. Anyway. Uh, Shows up with this rope. It's about uh, twenty some feet of rope, twenty thirty feet of rope, and says, "Hey, do you want this rope? It's it's it's, it's what's left over from the one Thomas used." And I have no idea where it even came from. It's black rope. That's what I was told. I never saw it. Black rope, and that was the same color rope that was around Thomas's neck and over one of the uh, bar- or one of the uh, trusses in the garage, and. Uh, and I just found out about that uh, within the last two, two and a half months that uh, my friend was uh, offered the rope. Well, now this this was a black rope that like the police carry. It wasn't a. Yes, that's what I that's what I understand. Yes, and and uh, uh, the the rope that uh, Thomas was uh, being supported with uh, was also black. And I'm wondering where did he get this rope from? You know, and I I even asked that. Uh, Thomas's uh, place of employment. If they had any black rope like that, because I, I walked around and there wasn't any there. And uh, his 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 boss there says, "No, we don't need rope, black rope." He says, "We don't have it here. There's none here." So I have no idea where the black rope came from. Hmm. I'd also I'd like to interject as well, Jeff. Yeah, that's oh yeah, this is uh, this is Tammy. Tammy is. Uh... Yeah, uh, Tammy she's, spent quite a bit of time with me. She's one of us. There's no doubt in her mind. I don't know if you know this lady or not, Rod, but uh, this lady you want to you want to get to know her because she's quite the investigator and uh, knows her stuff really well. Okay. On my Scribd account, um, in one of the police reports preceding Thomas's death, Todd Johnson was um, interviewing a victim of a rape, and the victim, a male victim, went into the Chippewa County Police Department and he reported this rape. And at that time, he stated, and it's in that report on my script account, um, he stated to the officer that he was raped by an Asian male. Todd Johnson turns around in the police report and says, no, you were raped by Thomas Erbs. And and he states this several times, as if he's posturing for Thomas' suicide, um, setting this up um, to show that Thomas committed suicide and that he didn't murder Thomas. This is all on my script account. Jeff also says, has told me 
um, in previous conversations, when Thomas was found, the rope was straight up and down, straight up and down the back of his neck. Yeah, this is really strange to me that, again, don't hate me for it, but at one time in my life, years ago, I was a paramedic, and I've seen hangings. And the way that you've described it to me, it's it's almost a physical impossibility to have right. a rope come directly off the back of the neck to go straight up to whatever's being It, it doesn't happen that way. No, I, I, and there was no yeah. pinky eye on Thomas. When Jeff and I, when I first got up to Chippewa County uh, and was speaking to Jeff about this incident, um, there was no petechiae, not one broken blood vessel, um, nothing that indicated that he had actually died by hanging. Mm-hmm. Um, we believe that he was probably placed there. And with the posturing, amount of posturing that that um, Officer Johnson did, it, it, it just blows my mind. Here's, it, I'm a female. If I go into a police department, or, or you the male, if you go into a police department and you say, I've been raped by um, a black man or whatever you want to say, when is there? When does that happen? It's impossible. The police report is on my script, and it, that's impossible. They don't tell me who raped me. I tell them who raped me. And for Todd Johnson to try to convince the victim of a rape that he was raped by Thomas Herbs, this was this guy's friend. Thomas was his friend. They were friends from uh, kindergarten or first grade. And another, and thank you, Tammy, for. Uh, Helping me out here because that's that's what we need to. This this was supposed to have happened on the Thursday night previous. Okay, that would have been like the 18th because Thomas was found on Father's Day of all things too. Uh, Man, they really loaded you up with all the. Uh... June 21st, June 21st of 2009, Father's Day, and Thomas was supposedly have done this to to Joe or his friend on the 18th of June, okay, because that's the night he got the tickets with the motorcycle and all that other stuff. And and uh, also, also uh, I forget the name of the test they take for finding DNA. Uh, that was done. That was done. But Officer Todd Johnson, it was from the city of Eau Claire, the police department, even 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 at, at the urging from the, the uh, supposed uh, uh, alleged a victim's family to have this test done with, he refused to do it uh, for uh, uh, for the betterment of the families or whatever. I don't know what word he used, but that's what, that's what he said. And they, they did the testing at the hospital or wherever they do that. And he re- refused to do that. And, and uh, uh, what... what uh, uh, Tammy, you have an actual copy of, of the Todd Johnson report, don't you? I script? do. I have all three. I have the death report um, uh, the um, and the preceding reports. And the third report that's on my script account is where Todd Johnson removes the black police-issued police rope from evidence and states that there's another investigation ongoing. Mm-hmm. That did not need to occur, and he did that for a reason. Um, there's other issues surrounding this as well. When Jeff asked the uh, medical examiner for her opinion, he was told that it did not match the officer's opinion, and he was never given anything in writing. Yeah, the, the coroner's report did not match either Officer Thornton or Officer Sergeant Cunningham's report. I was told that by uh, another member of the, the Chippewa County Sheriff's Department, an officer. And... and uh, didn't match uh, at all, and, and uh, so was there not? Was there actually an autopsy done on the on on your son? No, the the uh, it was uh, there should have been uh, because there was no suicide. No, in fact, I did find on my cell phone on late Monday. It was already decided then that they weren't going to do an autopsy. That my son had left me a message, and and. Uh, uh, the message said, uh, Dad, I'm calling to say that I love you. I know I haven't been saying that enough, especially lately. I want to thank you for always being there for me. You have been the best in the world. I love you. Goodbye. But I didn't discover that until, like, Monday afternoon, because sometimes, I don't know if you ever had this happen on your cell phone, but you don't get all, you don't get all your messages immediately. Sometimes they show up a little bit later. And that's what happened with this, 
because... And I need to interject again, Jeff, because this is the way that Jeff speaks. When Jeff and I speak and he's um, ending a conversation, that's the end of a conversation. That is normal conversation for Jeff and his family to have had. That wasn't a goodbye call to Jeff. It was very okay, so it wasn't like it wasn't to... like a death note or anything. This is no, just standard standard way no. they talk to each other. That is very standard. Jeff is he communicates in that fashion. Gotcha. Okay, and and the, the Saturday morning, which would have been the twentieth, after Thomas had the problem with his motorcycle, we went to pick him up. Uh, there there weren't any terse words from myself to Thomas at all. In fact. Uh, I said to him, I said, well, I know you're all shook up about, you know, your motorcycle breaking down and all that stuff, but you were supposed to go to work today, and if you're not going to go to work, you better call him because you're already, you know, like like a couple hours late here. I said, I'm sure they will understand, you know. And, and uh, in fact, I had my right arm around him as he was sitting at the table, and I told him, uh, you know, I, I, basically, it's, I don't remember all of it, it's, I hope you know, I hope you realize I hope you know how much you're loved and cared for and how proud I am of you and what what a great job I think you're doing in your life and all that stuff. And, and you know, uh, there wasn't any berating or anything like that. It was nothing, nothing like that at all. And anyway, uh, uh, they said at work that, that it was like after 9 o'clock and he was still couldn't settle down yet for whatever was going on. And uh, he came home and like I said that Message on the the, the cell phone uh, was somewhere before ten o'clock in the morning. What kind of job did he have, Jeff? He worked at a, a at a at a home supply store. So it wasn't a high stress, high high action type of job where he's going to get all stressed out over work. No, in fact, in fact, uh, uh, I have two twenty five dollar gift certificates hanging on my refrigerator. For him being an exemplary employee and for him doing such a great job and how much they valued his services there, and that's virtually unheard of with this company because they're they're pretty uh they're pretty tight with their money. And, and uh uh no, he was doing it wasn't like he was gonna lose his job or anything like that and and, and uh he was doing very, very well there. In fact, many of the people that he worked with actually showed up for his funeral even, so uh, it wasn't like he was being disparaged there at all. No girlfriend problems, anything like that? No, no, there wasn't any girlfriend problems. In fact, uh, I know many of his friends. They they call me or they'll, they'll uh, Facebook or emails, whatever. I, I uh, you know, I'm in contact with his friends, <coughs> quite, quite a few of his closest friends even yet. And uh, there were, nobody, nobody had even an inkling that, that Thomas was having any major problems such as this. None of them did. Well, this is turning into the kind of the common the way the police handle problems anymore. They just eliminate them, kill them. I mean, this is becoming very, very popular sport for most police departments. I know here in Fresno, it's a piece of crap. And they, here in Fresno, they even do it on television with it being broadcast. They're just ruthless right. pieces of shit. Well, there's, there's I sent you emails today. Um, the preceding story with Thomas is that he was a victim of uh, childhood sexual abuse. He was treated for that through the courts. And when, yes, he was. when Jeff was when Jeff was trying to get restraining orders against his ex-wife, um, the, the alleged perpetrator of these crimes, she was falsely accusing him. The judge would not issue the restraining orders, although Jeff had custody of the children. Um, it, it's just been just an amazing, an amazing help for Jeff my, and his both whole family. Both of my children, in fact. Let me interject. We're treated at state of Wisconsin facilities for sexual abuse. Both children were, and uh, we don't, you know, uh, if it would have been, if, if they would, if I would have even been suspected of that, I'd still be in prison today. Uh, right. And, and the, the scoop of the whole thing is, uh, like I said, at state facilities, it's it's, and. Uh, the way they the way they seemingly handled much of this is uh I wasn't party to many of the communications, but the mother always was mm-hmm. even even though with the daughter even though with the daughter uh there was an order uh 
that the mother could send the daughter uh, a, a letter, card, whatever, once a week. That was the only contact that was allowed with the mother with the daughter, and that was for nearly three years like that. And so, and and, and uh, my daughter was also also treated for sexual abuse at a state facility. So there is, uh, it's just like a hoodwink. And, and uh, uh, when Thomas turned 18 and he aged out and he was no longer a benefit to his mother mm-hmm. at that time, um, the, the police report for this is on my script again. Um, she had actually strangled him one night and he ended up calling 911. And when the police got out there, she admitted to strangling him because he didn't pay rent. And they oh did nothing God. to her. They did nothing to her. They asked him to leave that home. His 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 neck was discolored for, for two weeks. His what? Neck, where she choked him. Oh, really? And, and, the, and his the police part. did nothing for this? They did nothing? No, they, they said up there... They, they did going, nothing. If they were going to arrest anybody, they were going to take Thomas to jail because... because because of his record, they said. Uh, his teeth were loose, then, his nose was bleeding, his eyes were puffy, and his, like I said, his neck was discolored for a couple of weeks. Uh, this, same person, this, this, this same person uh, ran me down with a car, and I, and like it was, I was like uh, three and a half months in physical therapy, so I could go up and down stairs because she took my legs out from under me. Now this was this was a woman you were sleeping with, or your ex-wife. Well, this was my children's mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I emailed you his attempts to restrain her during those times. Yeah, apparently um, she still he, loved me, huh? <laughs> yeah. At that time, Judge Cameron would not would not allow a restraining order against her. Um, the most interesting thing is that she teaches fourth grade special ed classes to this day. Jesus, public what, what state are you in, Jeff? Uh, the state of denial? No, Wisconsin. <laughs> I want to cross that off my list of places to go. I mean, or send yeah. your yeah. children to school at. Yeah, there's right water out of- parks elsewhere. We have the you know some of the best water parks in, in in the world in Wisconsin, but they have other places too. But huh. uh, yeah, it's it's really Fruit Loop. I mean. So where's this at now, Jeff? What are you still working on this? Are you still going after him? Is Tammy helping you put a case together? Well, or are you still in their I'm, asses or what? What I'm kind of doing is 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 waiting for for more things to come out, which I think they will. Here here's the neat thing is is the the the, the coroner who refused who refused to doctor her report to match the, the, the of the two officers. Uh, she was doing a real good job. Everybody liked her. Uh, she retired, and so did that officer Thornton. They both retired that year, or soon after. Well, let's let's bring um, Rod. You there? Yep. You're kind of a brilliant mind when it comes to this legal stuff. What do you think about this story? And is there anything? If I'm not getting advice from you, but if you were in this position, what would you different do different? Is there anything else? And maybe I need to hook you and Tammy up uh, to get this. I'd really like to offer this man some help. He's just been used, abused, and thrown away wet. Um, what would you suggest? Anything? Well, see, you're running into the problems because you got the cop investigating, and they're gonna make their own report up. And even if they did the did the murder, mm-hmm. it's like they did with Don Matthews and Eric Taylor up in Ohio. All right, they shot their own cop, and they shot Don Matthews, and then they covered it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm fully aware of these things going on. So this is part of the problem with what we're dealing with, you know. Whenever you got the fox coming <laughs> and, and committing the crime and then down doing their own investigation, any of the evidence that you got or can get, they're going to sit here and tamper with the evidence. It would be better if you could get an investigator that could have came in and did the investigation and did his own, you know, search on this thing. But if you got the coroner that may have a little different of opinion on this, then you go with the coroner and see what they come up with and push us. I, I couldn't get the coroner's report. And I, I talked earlier with, with uh, Jack, and he said, you know, open or or the, the other guy, Chris, wasn't it? Do an open records request. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, uh, it, it's, it's stuff like this and, and what I've gone through in my life in the last few years and uh, 
uh, this thing on my son, I'm still not over that yet. It's it's very very hard for me to 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 deal with even yet at times. And and uh, if you lose somebody who your your child like this, who you you know who you love so so much, uh, it, it's it's a whole different world out there is what I'm going to say. And and uh, there have been, you know, like I said. People say this and people say that and all that stuff. You know, things can gradually come out. But the the problem with all of this was is, is he actually should have had an autopsy on him, and that would have been uh, required by by Wisconsin statute because there really was no suicide note, and and uh, it, it it should have it should have happened. It should have been automatic. Sure. Because there was there was questions, you know, and and. Uh, yeah, this is that's just an amazing story. It just goes to show you the depths of what this crappy country that we live in, with the boneheads that are running it, are are capable of doing to us. Well, the question well, comes to mind. Hold on. The question comes to mind is the rope. How do you know that this was actually a police rope and not something you could run down to the Army Navy store and get your hands on? Well, there there again, uh, the the the. This 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 priest from church is running around with this rope, offering it to people to give it to him, like it's some kind of a treasure. What is he doing with the rope? And this this guy also is like like friends with the children's mother's new husband, and he's running around this rope. And so there's a, there's a connect there, you know. Why does he have this rope if the police are investing this as a crime scene? Why does he have evidence? Yeah, the other thing that that troubles me is here you've just had shoulder surgery, what, two weeks prior? Yeah, 19 And they days. don't even try to gently let your son down. They just whack the rope and they let him drop on yeah. your and bad fact, shoulder. That, 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 that Cunningham, the sergeant here, Thornton refused to cut the rope. And, and, and uh, in the interim period here, what happened is the EMTs came in, hooked up whatever they hook up to with the fingers, Oh yeah, he's dead. Well, he was cold already. I mean, so, and then, so the coroner witnesses this. So she goes out to her vehicle to get a body bag. While she's going out to get this, that's when uh, Cunningham made his his last trip to the door to make sure there's no witnesses. And he, and he told Thornton to cut the rope. And Thornton says, "No." He says, "We got to wait for some more people here to support the body." And Cunningham says, "Sergeant Cunningham." I'm your sergeant, and this is an order. Cut the rope. I think he had the F word in there, too. Cut the rope. So Thornton cut it. Neither one of them made any effort to, 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 to hold the body. And, and uh, I, caught, I caught my son on his way down, kept him from hitting the ground. And I'm there standing with my kid. I grabbed, his, grabbed him, uh, hit the belt area of his pants, and I'm there holding him. And I says, you two effers better get out of here before I decide to kill the both of you. <laughs> and, and, and they they dashed out of there. I'm I'm a pretty husky guy. I got you know may not not exactly buff, but uh, they were, they're on their way out. And somebody told me this this friend that, that the priest offered the rope to said that that Thornton went across the yard. And he was swearing all the way to his car, so things didn't go quite as well as he thought they would. <laughs> and then when the coroner came back, and her name was Kay Garretts, she she says. What in the hell is going on here is what she said. And I'm there holding my kid up, and, and the, the cops are on their way out, and that's what she said. And so I'm holding him, and then uh, I, I can't tell you who showed up. I think the priest from church showed up, and uh, I think that's it. And then we put... Kay Garrett's put the, I'm holding on to Thomas yet. They put the body bag down on the floor, and here I am with one arm. I'm holding my kid yet, and I think the priest from church came in, and we put Thomas into the body bag. And then uh, a little later on there, the uh, uh, funeral home showed up, and then they came out with the uh, stretcher, whatever it is, and we put Thomas on that and then pushed him into the, it was like one of those minivans, and they took him to the funeral home. But all of this, all of this is going on, and and, and uh, uh, you know, here I am, and I lost my kid, and I've 
it's 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 just horrifically horrible on top of horrible and then and then I have these police officers officers doing this to my son and to me and all this other stuff going on and it's like you know and and, and so what what happens is like like uh you you kind of you know review all of this and it's like it it and you can't even believe that it it really happened like that and it did okay so terrorism it's terrorism yeah, it, it, employed it, on our citizens it's just yeah terrorism is right and, and uh, yeah it it's 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 uh it truly is beyond belief uh and, and like I said, this this Todd Johnson called Thomas on Friday night and, and told him he was just going to flat revoke his bond and, and uh, uh, put him in jail long enough to lose his job. That's what he told him. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, you have to go back a little bit further because if if this had affected Jeff in the manner that um, normally would affect a father finding his son on Father's Day, um, Jeff was likely, very likely, to have gone around and committed suicide, but that's their intent. In his prior divorce, um, they already got his pensions, and what they had done in a quadro, uh, that's a qualified domestic relations order, is written his ex-wife as his surviving spouse. That's impossible. She would never get that amount. Mm -hmm. That amount is automatically um, stuffed into the municipal uh, the municipality through ERISA. ERISA um, generates that any retirement account, like a union benefit, union pension, any type of retirement upon a quadro, it goes into the municipality. So here the court plays this and allows her to be the surviving spouse, but she's no longer married to him. She's his ex-wife. So the intent of all of this terrorism and the psychological effects on Jeff, what would it, that have amounted to? This is what they're doing across the country. They are killing our men in yep. any manner possible. This is terrorism, and those monies are being shuffled right into the municipality through ERISA. We have um, to stop this. Jeff, we have uh, to stop this. One of one of my readers here, Ro- uh, Rocco, know him pretty well. He's a pretty good guy. He wants to know where in Wisconsin was this? Uh, uh, Chippewa County, Wisconsin. Chippewa County, okay. I'm it's with northwestern that. Wisconsin. We're we're right here. We're about ninety uh, some odd miles uh, directly east of the Twin Cities, mm-hmm. Minneapolis, St. Paul. So where's it at now? I know you've got some other stuff that you're working on with Tammy too, right? Yeah, I'm going through another divorce because uh, <laughs> Thomas's stepmother divorced me that year too. Uh, not that year. She waited in 2010. Uh, she was nice enough. She went to work on. Uh, January 11th, and then sent me an email at 10 after 12 and said she'd moved out. <laughs> Jeez. But anyway, uh, yeah, and that's another that's another weird deal because I filed divorce on her immediately because I figured what was going on and and uh, uh, they never showed up for the for the initial hearing. They defaulted and and I'm still going to court yet. I I, I have said it should be defaulted and everything else. Filed right. motions for default and everything and. They re- and they what re- happened when she oh, didn't yeah. show up, and and the commissioner Ferg represented his soon-to-be ex-wife oh, at yeah. that time. Yeah, no one's there, and I here I am. I'm disabled. I asked for maintenance. I mean, the laws are supposed to apply equally to everyone. And he says, "Well, no." He says, "We're going to hold that open." He says, so he was, he did act as her attorney, and there, there's nobody even there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is. Uh, <laughs> okay. If you don't show up to court, what happens? If you don't show up to your court case, what you happens? Lose by, you lose by default. Right. You lose by default. But commissioner, right. But Commissioner and, and no, Ferg represented his soon-to-be ex-wife at that time. She didn't show up. There is there is no there, there is no defense to a default. I mean, you'd have to come up with some really, really good reasons, but I had filed with the clerk of court on, on the 13th that she was duly served by a process server, there was no objection to the service, and irregardless, if it was an objection to the service, the first time you'd be showing up for court would have been on the 19th, and no one showed up. In fact, uh, that court date, I was the first person there, 
and and I I says, well, I'm Jeff Herbs, and I'm here in on case number and all that stuff, and and uh, he says, well, there's no one here. He says, uh, uh, we're going to hear these other two cases in front of you. So two other people showed up, two other parties, okay, but their opposing parties never showed up, and they defaulted them, but they didn't default mine. And then after he dispensed with them, uh, that's that's when, you know, I, I filed a, a petition, and uh, <laughs> I had asked for maintenance because I had no job, I had no income, and and no, he held maintenance opening, which is which is a violation of statute. I have no job, I have no earning capacity, nothing, and uh, anyway. Jeff was electrocuted hand to hand in 1985. He used to be an electrician, and at the time of their marriage in 2002, Marianne was fully aware that he was disabled. He didn't work throughout the marriage, and he deserves maintenance. And when Commissioner Ferg um, represented his ex-wife, it all went downhill from there. He still does not have his maintenance. I, I still don't know, and and the battle continues, and and uh, other things. And uh, I even, of course, I've done a few things. I've disqualified uh, the attorney that she actually hired was an attorney I had for my first divorce. Well, that's a violation of confidences. And definitely an appearance of impropriety. So, I disqualified him and a partner in his business and their law firm on February 26th. Well, uh, TC Theater versus versus Warner Communications. It's a case from the Seventh District here in in, uh, uh, in the United States. I think the Seventh District is Wisconsin, Illinois, and Michigan. I believe. Anyway says that when you have established an attorney-client relationship, it's an irrebuttable presumption that, that confidences have been exchanged. Okay? So I had an attorney-client relationship with this attorney who happened to be also the district attorney of, of Chippewa County in the early 90s. And and uh, so then my estranged wife also hired this guy and had an attorney-client relationship with him. So... Once again, there's an irrebuttable presumption that confidence has been exchanged, so it, it doesn't take too much math. You don't need to wear your pencil down to see that whatever confidences I gave to this attorney, by law, an irrebuttable presumption, sure. she also has them. So I question the court, how, how the court could guarantee me uh, due process, in other words, fairness. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they couldn't answer my questions, and... and uh, Things proceeded to even get worse then. Well, but they did disqualify that attorney, his partner in the law firm, and then her new attorney at a, at a scheduling conference on April 22nd shows up. She has the entire file and all the records from the disqualified attorneys in the firm, and what what the rule is, is is that when the attorneys are disqualified because of the confidentiality, uh, their work, work product work, the work product is also all their work is disqualified too, and I filed to strike, <laughs> and of course I already had already filed for motion for default. And, and this and, is uh, the part where the judge comes in and represents her attorney. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And April twenty second, he told me. At a scheduling conference, that that a, that a, if if I filed a motion to disqualify the attorney, uh, he was going to going to deny it. You know what sounds to me thought, like you got here, Jeff? Sounds to me like you got a major cluster screw going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this is my way of being polite about it. <laughs> but you know what, Tammy? I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Were you on the call last night with Rod? No. No, I wasn't able to. Okay, stop. what I want to do is I'm going to bring Rod in here. We're going to we're going to pick up where we left off last night. What he's discovered, what he's found, what where the corner he's pushed these SOBs into, and I think you're going to get excited because Good. this will work with what you guys are doing, and we're going to bury some of these chicken shit cops and judges and Department of Motor Vehicles and the rest of the lot. The judge is the one I've I'm gunning for. I went with those black Good. faggots in the dresses. Because dresser. this judge, this judge Stephen Cray. Um, he's actually the grandson of the founder of Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Man, you definitely yeah. got to. Yep. Yes, and this is 
Yeah, Cray Computers. This is Stephen yeah. Cray of Cray Computers. Wow. Anyway, Rod, you I, I, with I me? call it I call it uh, Netlink skirts. You're very <laughs> being very polite. <laughs> but but the deal here is 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 uh, the abuse. I've been abused uh, in court and and other things and. I well, I'll tell you what, Jeff, you sit back and you can ask questions right. here of Rod, too, but when you hear what Rod's doing and how Alrighty. successful he's been. Rod, are you still with me? Yep. Let's get her up to speed, Rod. What are we doing and what am I going to be able to maybe get involved with and how am I going to kick some blue some blue clothes butt along with these black faggots in their, in their, in their dresses? I want to take them all on, take them all down. I want them to hate me worse than they already do. Well, what we've done here, folks, is we got into a traffic issue, and I took everything into an administrative court. I've got the administrative law judge to admit that the police department and the uh, DOT and the TAG agency, they're not public offices under the administration. They now, sl- slow that have- down and say that again so this sinks in real good. I read about that today. Uh, what we did is I took this stuff into an administrative court against the DOT, TAG agency, and the police department. I got the judge to make a ruling that they are private contractors. They're (laughs) not part of the administration. Uh, The judge said if I didn't like it, do an appeal. So I did. I took it into a judicial review. I come back in and I argue the fact, put it to laws and says, no, here they are. They are a public office under you know, North Carolina statutes, 17D, as in David. This is the law enforcement. It is administration. It is an agency under the state. I went back in, did the DOT and the tags, and here it is. Here's your law. Well, the attorney general came in and they argued this is no, no, no. These are private contractors. They don't work for the state. They're not state agencies. They're not state departments. They're strictly private. And the judge upheld the ruling of the lower court. Well, when they did this, now stop and think here. I did not go into a regular county court. I took this into an administrative court for a very specific reason. Because an administrative court deals with administrative agencies that belong to the state. This is supposed to be the court that if we have a problem with one of their people, we take them into. I got two courts that ruled that the police department and the DOT and the TAG agency, they are not part of the state. They're not part of the agencies. They're not part of the administration. They're purely 100% private contractors. Sounds to me like you should have a bunch of these idiots grabbing their ass and heading for the hills. Good, because that makes them um, a militia outside the U.S. government, then, doesn't it? All right, so whenever you're dealing with a private contractor, these people have no more authority to pull you over because the moment they pull you over, this is now an impersonation of a public official. Right. They are carjacking you, and this is now piracy. Right. And there are <laughs> militia outside the U.S. government, which falls under treason. The issue is, is since 1802 and the Judiciary Act, Congress no longer has the authority to charge for treason. Really? I was unaware of that. So that's how they got around this, huh? Right. So what we're back to is how do we charge them with treason? How do we indict them? Okay, by I do what we're doing right now is I'm still setting the stage on the Department of Transportation because we have a ruling that they are private contractors. All right, under the Highway Safety Act, if you get into Title 23, USC Code under 402, this deals with the grant. If you get into Title 23 CFR under Section 1250, this deals with 40% that goes to your political subdivision out of the Highway Safety Act. Right. Those are the special drawing rights out of the IMO. All right. But now this goes into Title 49 USC, 
and Title 49 CFR that deals with the, the license for the vehicle, the registration, and it, CFR deals with the driver's license itself. It goes in and shows that there are only two types of driver's licenses, a CDL and a commercial motor vehicle. Each of these had their specific definition for what it applies to. All right. It does not apply to the average person out here. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need something or a tag on our vehicle. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that a CDL is specifically designed, and it tells you it's for semi-trucks and trailers. A commercial, right. commercial. A commercial motor vehicle is specifically designed for state officers, federal officers, political subdivisions, and anybody that is in commerce carrying produce or a person for compensation. The things are the, the statutes are very, very plain and clear on what they're sitting here saying. So what I'm doing is I say, okay, fine. This is what your statutes sit here and say. But see, I'm throwing a twist in the nest. And what I'm doing is I'm coming back in under the bankruptcy of 1933, and I'm addressing, says, okay, under H.R. 1491, which is Public Law 1, 48 Stat C1, it sits here and says that I have to register all my stuff to you, and it requires me to have a license. Fine. If this is the case, then under the bankruptcy, you now came responsible for my vehicle because you're using it as collateral. You're using it right. to securitize for the state. That means right. you've got to pay my insurance. you got to keep <laughs> up on it. No, because they came in with the lend lease agreement, the master and lend lease agreement right after that in 41 and the Atlantic Charter there in 41-42. And what they did there is they promised to pay back that debt by your production. But they haven't. Yes, that's what the GDP is. Gross domestic product is your production. That's what code is. You're codified. Each time you're diagnosed or you abuse somebody or somebody abuses you, um, you're paying back those loans. Each time you're born. Tammy, I think you were telling me if you check your birth certificate, it's actually codified on there. Uh, with a right. barcode, right? You have a you have a bond amount on your birth certificate. You can go into um, CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. From there, those are the loan amounts. Each title, chapter um, chapter forty two. This is the welfare and and um, Social Security and all that bullshit. It's called accounts, and those are the loan amounts on on whatever bond they're taking out, fixing up a hospital, whatever else. To pay those back, you come down to U.S. code, and you come into administrative code in each municipality, and then you have to match those amounts, the loan amount, with the actual code and title. Those are your case numbers and your bond number on your birth certificate. The first two numbers, um, sometimes they'll have a date preceding the first two numbers. That's the title number that you're paying back. Um, if you're not producing throughout your life paying taxes, they're going to snag you and put you in jail or whatever else they're going to do, um, especially children. This is how they're taking children. Um, children and females are animals. Um, when I was, when they, that guy was beating my head in um, back in Washington, um, I was codified under the animal code because I belong to Caesar, um, which is just disgusting. Um, but it says it right in Bouvier's Maxims, you know, children... Our offspring shall follow the condition of the mother, as is the case in slaves and animals. Free men shall follow the condition of the father. If you are not married, um, your wife or your girlfriend or, or the mother of your children, they have no protection. They're shadow of the state. If you are not married, your children are shadow of the state. 